Good morning, New Life. Um, our high school, t- oh, my name is Misty. <laughs> Forgot that part. Um, our high school teens are doing a serve project um, from our Rooted series that we had done. And we are, um, I contacted Brandon and Bethany Baird, um, our missionaries in Mexico, and they take care of an orphanage down there, um, King's Kids. And so we want to donate a new pair of shoes to each one of the kids in the orphanage. There was 17. I think we're down to about 10 or we need 10 or 11 more pairs of shoes. So we have a tree out in the lobby that has little bells. It works similar to the wishing tree, if any of you have ever seen that at Fred Meyers. You just take the bell, you'll buy a brand new pair of shoes and bring it back to the church and it'll need to be here by December 9th. Um, You can also donate for it to help to cover the cost for shipping, you can do that at the kiosk, and I believe the ladies at the info desk can help you with that. You'll just add a note saying um, Christmas Shoes Mission, and then we will get those shoes sent off to the orphans in Mexico. Right, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today here in your house, Lord, and I just I want to pray and your blessing over the service today, Lord. Just pray that you fill this room with your Holy Spirit and open each and every one of our hearts that we may hear your word and speak to us and and show us things about ourselves that we may need to know and learn and disciple others in that. Lord, and I just want to pray um, for Pastor today as he gives us a word and just be with him as he speaks. And I thank you very much for our teens, Lord, and their heart. Uh, forgiving, Lord, and they want to help these orphans in Me- Mexico. I just pray that the church sees their heart and 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 joins us in that. Um, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand? Let's worship.
When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. I spoke words, you sing it all for me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Good. 
and earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, blackness, love of God. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Shadow, you won't. And you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Shall you want?
what you do. This is what you do. You make more things so. This is what you do. This is what you do. You make all things so. This is what you do. This is what you do. something in me you saw something in me the God who created every wonder of his earth saw something in me oh, I must be worth it I must be worth it Some of you just need to sing that over yourself. You've been seeing through a lens where you don't see yourself as enough. You've been seeing through a lens where really all you see is yourself. I just pray that you have heaven's eyes this morning. You see that you are worth it. That the Father will give his only son to stand in your place. Whether you deserve it or not, he gave it anyway. this week asked me um, about the song that we're about to sing that I wrote and what the meaning was. And so I just wanted to explain real fast before we go into it. Um, when I was up here leading worship, the chorus kept coming to mind to me. It was just one step, one trust, one move, just one step closer to you. And I was in my midst of praying for you guys. I was like, Lord, how do I get these people to, to move? And then he just replied. He's like, well, what did it take for you? And I was like, well, I don't know. Let's think. And um, I was like, for my whole life, I mean, I grew up as a Christian, but my whole life, I always wanted somebody else's religion. I wanted, I wanted their walk with Jesus, and so I would like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. They're so, they're so amazing. I want what they have, and so I'd go after it, and then I would fail, and then I'd go back into the world. And I'm like, I would just get discouraged a ton, and then I tried again, and really, it was, I didn't want somebody else's walk. I didn't want to make the moves to to get where they were. I wanted it just to happen overnight, and that's not reality. It doesn't happen. Our relationship, like any relationship, takes time and investment. And so with me, the words just one step, that's what it took for me. It's just 
committing to that one step. And that looked in my own life after divorce and becoming a single mom to two daughters is when I really was like focused down on that. Okay, what is that one step? Is it just opening my Bible? Is it maybe getting my Bible off the shelf? Is it maybe attending, going to church more than attending and starting to serve now, getting involved, maybe letting people kind of come in and know my life, know my ugliness? Like those are all just one steps. And then one steps lead to a, lead to one trust. You know, he put opportunities in my life where he's like, Hillary, are you gonna are you gonna trust me in this? You know, when I had no money, are you gonna trust me that I'm gonna pay your bills? And so that one trust and then that one trust turned into one move. And then after that, it was like slowly but surely, I became so close to Jesus. It was amazing. And so I want to just encourage you guys um, through these words as we're singing them. It just takes one step sometimes. And one step can move a generation. Like my girls' lives will be forever changed because I took that one step. You know, and now I'm running full board. I love Jesus. Um, and it's, it's just awesome to see where I'm at and where I've been. And I am that faith that I always wanted. But there's a lot of ugliness and a lot of brokenness involved that got me here. And so I just want to encourage you. So when I was praying on the words and what he wanted me to um, put in a song, I've never written a song in my all my life. Like that's his department. Um, and so I just want to, um, it was just amazing like how he came, it came, just came and I was like crying. I was like, is this for real? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm really excited to share this with you guys and have you sing this. But that's what the words mean to me. And that's where my heart was when I wrote this song. I don't want to run out of time 
some of these feet of mine. Move these feet of mine. I hear you calling and I don't want to run out of time. Some of these feet of mine to just one step, one trust, one move. To just one step closer. Feet of mine, I hear you calling, and I don't want to run out of time. So move these feet of mine, move these feet of mine. I hear you calling, and I don't want to run out of time. So move these feet of mine to just one step. One trust, one move, just one step closer to you, just one step, one trust, one move, just one step closer to you.
You show up in splendor And you change the whole room How do I say Thank you, Lord For the life that you gave And the cross that you wore For the love you poured out To ransom my soul My heart
show up in your splendor and change the whole room. You don't have to come. You always do. You show up in you change the whole room. Come let them change this whole. prepare to uh, give tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, yeah, in this uh, past week of Thanksgiving, we have so much to be thankful for. We also have so much to give. Lord, we ask that you bless um, our tithes and our offerings, um, that they may be used to increase, increase your love increase your power, and increase the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Move forward your tithes and offerings.
can change the whole world. Did you feel it? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just came through a holiday that we were thankful for all that you've given us and done for us. Thankful for our families, thankful for our friends, thankful for jobs, thankful for food, thankful for pie from Costco. <laughs> thankful, Lord God, but also that every time you're involved, it changes everything. Yeah. And I think about, Lord, how different life is without you. And Father, with you in our lives, it's just, there's peace and there's joy and there's happiness. So, Father, I just pray that we continue that today. Just learn a little bit more about you today. Maybe a little bit about ourselves. It will draw us closer to you. We love you, Father. In Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, worship team. I forgot that it was um, children wearing pajamas to church day. <laughs> And I was telling Tony Ann that if I would have remembered that, I would have bought myself a pair of... Would have left a lasting image on any new visitor to New Life. <clears throat> I'm very proud of New Life for stepping up to the challenge uh, of Rooted, what we just came through. Last Sunday was... Uh, incredible watching those new believers take a step of baptism in that very warm Hawaiian-like waters of Young's Bay. And I appreciate those of you that did not eat the uh, cupcakes so that there was more left for me. It was one of my thankful thoughts this holiday season. Thankful for people who are on diets and don't eat sweet things, Joey. More for me. But I'm very proud, especially of uh, the facilitators who, who led the groups. And some of you have never really led a group before, and this was kind of a first time. And, and uh, we worked you. That was uh, ministering to people is, is not easy, not because people are not easy, but because it's, it's spiritual battles that we're facing, that, that we're working with. And uh, some of you, I, I thought of a couple of groups that I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, that group is going to eat that person alive. And, and it didn't happen. That literally, um, God just, uh, I think, called out the, the gifts that these people had, and we got to see them do just great and mighty things. And just I'm just very excited about the things that God has done in that. But with that, this has been a long year for us, New Life, has it not? Okay, maybe it's just me. It's been a long year for me. Uh, and, and like me, many of you have given up a lot to move new life to where she is right at this moment, and I think we're in a great place. Um, but as I thought about the I Disciple series, we've been working on how to disciple people all year long, and I thought, you know, we need to stop and, s and end the year just taking care of ourselves for a moment so we can get ready for next year. Um, I, I think it's, it's good to, to minister to people, but I think at some point in time you've got to stop and make sure that you're ministering to yourself, Amen. Because if you're unhealthy, you're not going to be able to help, help people become healthy. Uh, a sick mother doesn't help her children. Amen? So we want to make sure that we're uh, healthy. And so, um, so I thought about kind of what God has been speaking to me about the last few months in, in my own spiritual health. And one of the passages that jumped out at me, we're going to spend the rest of the year in, it's one passage, there's more we'll add to it, but there's basically one passage, and it's Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, uh, and it's on prayer, and I'll just make this statement real quick before we go farther. Prayer is the greatest indicator of the spiritual health of any disciple. Your prayer life indicates how healthy your spiritual life is. If you don't pray much, you don't obey much. Amen, that was good. You should write that down. <laughs> Did we get that on Facebook? I should get some thumbs up or something from that. Amen? But, <laughs> amen, I can't even remember what I said. It was so good. <laughs> but 
I, I do believe that prayer is the greatest indicator of the spiritual health of any disciple, of any believer. If you uh, pray empty, uh, your, your answer is going to be empty. You're gonna, and you're going to wonder why God's not answering your prayers. It's because they're empty. And so we want to help you with your prayer life. And Jesus prayed this prayer in the garden, and this is the one that jumped out at me. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. And he said this, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. And I'm sorry, I'm mixing up my King James with my ESV and probably a little living Bible in the middle of it. So, uh, But that's, that's kind of what he, what he said. And what he did was he, he called on God. And, 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 and this Father, God, the, the word is Abba, and it means Daddy. And there's only two men in the Bible that you'll find praying to Daddy, and it's Jesus and Paul, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But he calls out to Abba, or Daddy, and he states, he makes a statement that everything's possible for you. And then he cries out in petition, let this cup pass from me. And then he surrenders his will or his way to God's way. And so it's, it's just simple. Jesus prayed this simple prayer. It's the, similar to the prayer that he taught his disciples uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing. It's, so this was kind of Jesus' way of prayer. This was, and I don't think there was a more healthy disciple than Jesus. Would you agree with that? And so this is kind of the way that Jesus prayed. There's some things in it that I think are important for us to understand. And I think he basically said, Daddy, if it's possible, I don't want to go through this. But nevertheless, I'm going to do what you want me to do. That was kind of the prayer. And immediately, as I read this, I had some questions. I don't know if you read the Bible that way. But I'm like, I'm like wait a minute. Wait a minute. I struggle relationally with you as a daddy. I get you as a father, but as daddy, I don't know. And I know things, all things are possible, but I'm not sure they're probable. Okay, now quit looking at me that way because that's not fair. <laughs> and and I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard on my ego. It's, I don't think this is going to be good for me, God. Okay, I, I'm, I, that's just the way I was praying there. And I, I won't get my way. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter because you're going to get your way anyway. Want to find how warped <laughs> my prayer life is at times? And I just thought these thoughts. I, I just don't understand daddy. Now, some of you do, and I hear some of you, and it makes me want to slap you every time. Because you got something I don't got. And I, don't understand, I didn't understand it. And I'll just be honest. I have doubts. I know that all things are possible for God. I know that all things are possible, but I think they're probable for me. Now, I don't think that way about you. I believe that God is, if you come up and say, I need God to do this. I believe God will do that for you. If you need to be healed, God will heal you. I believe if God needs to move on your behalf, God will move. But when it comes to me, it's probable. Possible, probable. And I don't want to do this. I'll just be honest. Sometimes God asks me to do things. I don't want to take that step. I like where I'm at. I don't want to get out of the boat. If Jesus wants to be out of the boat, let Jesus be out of the boat. If Peter wants to get out of the boat, get out of the boat, Peter. But I'm not sure I want to get out of the boat. <laughs> Am I the only one that has these prayer issues? <laughs> and then the idea doesn't make a difference. I mean, why am I praying? I, I mean, why do you tell us to pray, believing this is best, something that could be devastating to my own self-worth, which feels forced upon me to believe that it's the best thing for me? But it surely doesn't seem that way. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. See, if prayer is the number one indicator of spiritual health, then a proper perspective on Father God is necessary for our prayer lives to be fulfilling and hence our spiritual life to be healthy. A proper perspective on who God the Father is is necessary for us to have a healthy spiritual life. Jesus understood this. And Paul understood this. And I think there's two reasons why they understood it. I have this group that I'm developing that is helping me with sermons. We're going to do some other things. I'm really excited about these, the teachers that God is beginning to raise up. 
uh, at New Life, and uh, one of them pointed out that only Jesus and Paul looked at God as Abba, and why didn't the Old Testament prophets? And I think it's the, the same reason why some of us struggle with who God the Father is, and I think it's because of one of them is in light of our religion. If in our religion we were taught that God the Father was a father, not a daddy, that we're always going to look at God the Father as a father, not a daddy. We're going to look at him uh, in the way maybe our fathers were, or maybe that we perceive a father should be. And I also think we see it in light of our relationships, how good your daddy was. And I see some, some people had bad fathers understand daddy in relation to God because they see God that way. But, but if you've had a decent father, he was a decent, he may not have been a daddy, but he was a decent father, you're going to wrestle with whether or not God can be a daddy or not because you're always going to look at him in light of this good father that you had. See, I had a good father, and many would call him godly, but my perspective of him was this. This is, this is how I viewed my father. A father goes to work. It's what he does. Every day I woke up, my father was gone. Why? Because he got up earlier than me and went to work and worked all day. And I saw him when he came home. He was dirty, so obviously he did something other than roll around. I mean, I might have been rolling around in the dirt. I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> but he did something. But I always knew there was food on the table and there was always money in the bank and there was always heat in the, in, the, in the furnace, my father worked and provided for me. So in my mind, when I view God, I view him as a provider because he, he, that's where my father was. My father was always providing for his family, and he had eight kids, so he had to work extra hard to provide for us. I saw my father as somebody who was leading the family. He was the decision maker. Now, I realize in this day and age that you guys got a little more balanced, but in my generation, in my father's generation, it was a husband that led the family, and they, they're the ones that decided where we lived and what we did and how we did it and if we did it and if we didn't do it. Uh, the father was kind of the leader in that. So I look at God, Father God as a decision maker because that's how I was. I just, just how my, it's not that my mom wasn't involved in the conversations, but when it came down to it, it was dad that said, this is what we're going to do. Fathers, for, for me, um, my father carried the responsibility, meaning he carried the weight of the family. Meaning if there was not food on the table, it was not my mom's responsibility to make sure that happened. It was his. He, he bore that heavily. Um, he was responsible for whether or not my family was cared for and comforted and, and watched over and protected. It was my father's responsibility to raise us up in church. Uh, he was very responsible in that way. But when you carry responsibility, there's often a, some distance and maybe some, let me get the right word, uh, maybe he carried it alone. And I, I don't know about you, but when, when I looked at my father, I always felt like he was a little bit separated from me because I watched him carry the weight of the family. When my brothers and sisters, again, there's eight of us and I'm the baby, when my brothers and sisters didn't have work my, and my dad wasn't working and could have just stayed home and done nothing, he went, and f went out and found work and worked so that my family could have jobs because he felt responsible for his family. But I always felt there was just this distance. You know, dad was this hard-to-reach guy because he was he had such a heavy weight on him and my father disciplined when wrong it was I heard the words all the time wait till your father gets home <laughs> I would have loved for my mother to have disciplined me I would have given anything for my mother to have disciplined me I would have thought that was the greatest thing ever but to wait till your father gets home. Because dad didn't come home and ask me any questions. Dad came home and mom answered all the questions for him. And all I heard was the footsteps. And hit under the bed. See, his job was punishment, not development. That was his place. And I said it, he was a good father. I had a good father, but I didn't have a daddy. Now that doesn't mean that I never saw him as a daddy. Because here's kind of the thing that I grew up with. We had, my parents had 24, 25 grandkids. And so being the baby of eight, my oldest sister, who was 18, had a baby so that I had a nephew that was a year younger than me. So I grew up with people that were about my age 
that were nephews and nieces. They were grandkids. They were, they were not kids. And I watched my father be a papa, be a daddy, more of a daddy to my nephews and nieces than he was to me. Now, don't, don't be feeling sorry for me. I had a good father. I'm just trying to help you understand the difference between father and daddy, or daddy and father, yeah. And I watched my, my dad play with the grandkids. He would never play with me. If I wanted him to get on the floor and let me ride on his back, he's like, oh, oh, you know, no. I... <laughs> or, or, or I'd try to play with him like he would play with the grandkids, and he, he would always yell at me, what do you do? Grow up. Go feed some cows. Go do something. <laughs> you know, trying to teach me responsibility. That was my father. But I watched him play. As a papa, he played. As a father, not so much. I watched my dad laugh with his grandkids. If I did something to try to get my father to laugh, he would yell at me and say, you're being stupid, grow up. (laughs) But my, my, my nephews and nieces, his grandbabies, he would just sit and watch them. And you could just see this huge smile on his face. He loved his grandchildren. It was different. It was a different kind of love. And he would laugh. He would laugh at the stupid things they do. Stupid things they do. He would have laughed at that, maybe, or said, learn how to speak. (laughs) And I watched my, 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 my father encourage or build up the kids. He, he, he was always trying to, to build them up. He wasn't trying to put any responsibility on them. He, he wanted them to believe that they were awesome, and they were amazing, and they were strong, and they were smart, and they were funny, and they were good. And, and I'm like, get a little bit of that over to the sons. And I watched my father gently teach each of his grandkids so as to not to bruise their little egos. He never wanted them to feel bad about themselves. He never called them names that he called his kids. (laughs) I know it sounds like I had a horrible father. He was not a bad man, but he was a father. He had had responsibility, and he had to deal out punishment, and he had to lead the family, and he had to provide, but he didn't have to do that with his grandbabies. He could just be daddy. Now, the truth is, I'm more of a daddy to my granddaughter than I am or was to my children. I'm just being, I'm I'm being honest. I don't know what it is about being a father, but for some reason, we get knucklehead written all over us, and we just, we we get this mindset that says, I'm the provider, I just go to work, I got to lead the family, I got this heavy responsibility, I disciplined when wrong, but I'm never a daddy to my kids. Because I'm so busy being a father. And I thought about this. I asked myself, when does Abba Father play with me? When does Abba Father laugh with me? When does Abba Father encourage me? And when does Abba Father teach me so as to not not to bruise my little ego? (laughs) And I thought about this. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am, though. Because that rarely happens. <laughs> My father also taught me humility. Didn't work very well. <laughs> Do you know I believe this about God? Papa plays with me whenever I ask him to. I think he puts down everything and he focuses on me. I think he wants to actively engage me in energetic activities, exercises. I think he plays with me every time he challenges me to step out in faith. You know, daddies try to get their children to, to step out of their fears and step out of, away from their fears and, and, and to step into something where they can trust him, where they can build trust and faith in themselves and in, and in others. And I thought about this verse in Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, But now the Lord who created you, O Israel, says, Don't be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by my name. You're mine. I would have loved to have heard my dad, my, my father as a daddy, say, you, you're mine, man. You're mine. I love you. You're mine. And then it says this. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I'll be with you. Because that's what daddies do, right? They challenge us to step out of faith, step into faith, and step out of ourselves. And, and they're there the whole time. Now, fathers will take you and throw you in the, in the lake and say, Swim. 
Daddies will throw you in the lake and follow you. Amen? And to them, it's funny. It's play. To you, there might be a little bit of fear, but after a moment, you'll settle down and know that your father's right there. Your daddy is right there. He's never left you or, or forsaken you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned, and the flames will not consume you. Why? Because he's my daddy. He's always there with me. He's always there for me, and he wants me to play. And play isn't doing something meaningless. Play is actually stepping out in faith and, and seeing things about myself that I never knew. So my dad did when he taught me how to play basketball. He was more of a daddy when we played basketball than ever because he was trying to play with me but teach me some things, some skills, some abilities. Obviously, it didn't work very good because I'm not playing basketball. And I'm a short, fat, white guy. <laughs> I think he plays when we worship together. I, I think, uh, I think he, he loves us to engage him in active worship. And I'm not talking about singing. I'm talking about literally following him and living for him and, and serving him and sacrificing for him. I think he's actively engaged in that. I think he plays with me uh, when we're on a play date called Sunday morning. He comes and he, he takes all of us little baby, his little baby believers and he puts us all in a room and, and, he, and he's, he's in the midst of the room. It, the scripture says we're two or three are gathered together in my, in my name there I am in the midst of them. And he comes and he wants to play. Which is why I think church should have joy and humor. Amen? Because I think he's up there saying, come on, let's have some fun. This is good. We're all together. So those of you that aren't singing, come on, man, just get into it. Those of you that aren't laughing during the preaching, maybe you just need to settle down a little bit and enjoy what's happening right now. You've got an idiot on a platform making a fool of himself, and he thinks he's called to this, and you, this is good stuff. He even said preaching was foolish. Come on. I think Papa laughs with me whenever he's with me. You know, every time I'm with Bria Leanne, my granddaughter, I just laugh. I just, she, she's, just, she's funny. She's four years old, and, and she does things that just make you laugh. Even the rebellious things are funny. <laughs> Come on. Now, as a father, you're like, don't look at me like that. But as a grandpa, you're like, that's hilarious. That's great. <laughs> you're awesome. Do you know that I think, I, I feel like he just finds joy being in, not just me being in his presence, but his being in my presence. I love watching my dad look at his grandkids and just laugh and be happy and think this was awesome. See, I don't think he's as unhappy with you as you think he is. I think when he's around you, he just wants to laugh at you. Even when you're depressed, he's like, what are you, what are you so sad for? And then he makes the Eeyore sound. And <laughs> Let me read you a verse. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. For the Lord your God has arrived to live among you. Just making sure they had it on the wall. <laughs> he is a mighty Savior. He will give you victory. Can you be sad if you're guaranteed victory? I mean, can, can you, like, if you, if, if you know you're going to win, okay, board games with my kids. If I know I'm going to win, it's a fun game. <laughs> right? If I step into any activity I know I'm going to win, it's like, this is awesome. Let's go. How come you're not so pumped, loser? <laughs> when you go through rivers of death, <laughs> oh, it's wrong verse. I'm sorry. <laughs> He will rejoice over you with great gladness. He will rejoice over you. I think of that when I think of my granddaughter. I think of that when I think of my father and his grandkids. It was just so, it, just so joyful to be around my grandbaby. It just, she makes me laugh doing nothing. She can just, uh, my, she's four years old. She loves Snapchat. It's the funniest thing on the planet. I think Snapchat's stupid. She thinks it's awesome. So because she thinks it's awesome, I think she's awesome. <laughs> my wife got her into that. No, hold on. <laughs> if you've gotten a Snapchat from my wife, please uh, forgive me now. <laughs> <laughs> it 
look at this. He will love you and not accuse you. God isn't thinking what you think he's thinking about you. Daddy doesn't think that way. Father might, but daddy doesn't. Daddy does not think negative things about you. It's Satan that's the accuser of the brethren, not God. Don't attribute things to Satan that, 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 or God that, aren't, that are Satan. That's what he wants to do. God's looking at you, and he's rejoicing over you with great gladness. And he loves you, doesn't want to accuse you. Is that a joyous choir? Do you hear what I hear? Hey, wait a minute. That's a Christmas song, isn't it? No, it's the Lord himself exalting over you in happy song. Your, your papa, your heavenly father, your Abba father is laughing over you now. Whatever's going on in your head, he's saying, what? Where did that, don't say it. That's what he's saying, don't say it. See, I think papa encourages me when he, whenever he speaks to me. You know that God doesn't think about you the way that you think about you? So if you think God's thinking something, you're thinking it, not God. He doesn't speak to you the way that you speak to you. Because that's not how Papa's talk. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you. I know God says the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. Have you been thinking that Father God is thinking about peace with you? He's thinking about you, and he's thinking peace, peace, peace. Not of evil. He's not thinking of evil over you. Could you imagine being a parent only thinking of evil over your child? You're not going to love that child very well, and that child's not going to have a happy life. But God, Abba Father, doesn't think of evil. You know, when I think of my granddaughter, I never think there's no evil in her. She is absolutely... The most incredible child ever. You say that's because she's your granddaughter. Yes. <laughs> she's mine. Jeremiah. Isaiah. And you know what I thought about this? To give you an expected end. Do you know that Father God's always trying to build me up? He's never trying to cut me down. He's always trying to build me up. Now, I don't know what your earthly father was like, but there's some things my father said to me throughout the, my history that have kind of stayed with me, and I'm not going to share them with you because it's none of your business. <laughs> but they hurt. Father God's never said anything hurtful towards you about you. Because that's not what he thinks about you. He doesn't think evil. He doesn't want to tear you down. He doesn't want to make you think ne- that he thinks negatively about you. I mean, how many of you have f- done something wrong? You've, you've stepped into a sin, and the first thing you think is, oh, God hates me. God does not hate you. God does not hate you. God sacrificed his son for you. God loves you that much. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have hope. He wants to believe the best in you. Can you think evil of this little baby making noise in church? Come on, are you one of those cranky old church people that's mad because the baby's making noise in church? Let's just get it out there while we're there. Because everyone else isn't paying attention to the sermon. They're just listening to the cute little baby. Because I think that's what God's doing most of the time. He's just listening to the cuteness in you. He's not looking at all the crap that's in the diaper. Isn't that what you're focused on? He wants to build you up. And Papa teaches me to make my life better. See, he only disciplines rebellion after he has extended huge amounts of grace. You know, as a, as a father, my, my father would come home, something would be wrong, he would not ask no questions, discipline was immediate, swift, and painful. Consistent, but immediately swift and painful. When I disciplined my kids, I often didn't think about anything other than they did something wrong and I need to deal with it now. Come on, dads. Been there? 
But God doesn't discipline that way. He extends so much grace. Have you never sinned and just not wondered, waited for the other shoe to drop? I mean, I'm looking around the corner waiting for dad to come through the door. I'm waiting to hear the pickup come in the driveway and going, oh man, run for the bed and jump underneath because he can't see me there. See, I think God does that because he's seeking to understand why we do what we do. And I thought about this with my granddaughter and how I've never really had to discipline her. She's just this perfect child. But I also ask these questions about her. And I think God asks these questions about us. Maybe I'm wrong. You guys can call me a heretic if you want. This is just what I believe about Papa, about Daddy, about Abba Father. I think he wonders, are you tired? Have you noticed that when you're tired, you don't always respond right? I probably sin more when I'm tired than when I've got lots of sleep. Don't ever ask me any questions after 8 o'clock at night. You will not like the answer. It will be true, but it will not come across right. And, I, and I'm sorry. I'm tired. I just, I just I can't control myself when I'm tired. Have you ever seen that baby in the, in the restaurant and they're just blowing a gasket and, and the parents are all panicking? And, you know, what I do now, now as a father, I'd be like, you know, you need to discipline your child. <laughs> but as a pop, I'm like, man, you can tell they're worn out. So you're a fool to take a baby to a restaurant if you didn't give them a nap that day. You, you deserve what they're doing. <laughs> that is God's discipline on you. Don't discipline that child. You didn't let them get a nap and stay home, you fool. <laughs> Amen? Don't blame the baby for being tired. You probably kept them up all night. <laughs> That's how it works, right? I think he looks at us and says, are you stressed? Have you noticed how stress makes for bad decisions? And I think he looks at us and says, so what are you... What are you stressed about? Why don't you just pull back a little bit and relieve that stress and just let me work with you on this decision. Because when I'm stressed, I don't make good decisions. Because pressure rarely allows us to make right decisions. And so I think he looks at us and says, were you under pressure? And why were you under pressure? Why didn't you just pray and wait on me? Well, probably because I thought you were a father, not a daddy. And I think he looks at us when we sin and he asks, what, what problems are you facing? Because different problems put us in different positions. And the reality is that I think he looks at us and, and wonders that. I think he wants to know if we're confused. Sometimes we make wrong decisions. We think it's a right decision. It's a wrong decision because we're confused about what's right because we haven't actually checked with daddy to find out what would have been the right decision. You know, one of the worst things about my life as my father passed away 15 years ago, I have not had an earthly daddy on this planet to just go to and say, dad, what do you think? And if you have one and he's a good father, you ought to praise God that he's around, that you can go to him and say, hey, dad, what do you think? Because if you don't have that person to go to, you're going to be confused because you're probably going to ask your peers questions and peers are... Peers are right in the same place you are, man. <laughs> They're just as confused. And I think God disciplines us, he says, for our good. I'm not saying he doesn't discipline us, but I think he thinks about how I'm going to do that and why. Because he doesn't want to damage us. I think he still cares about our little egos. Not from a pride standpoint, but I think he wants us to make sure that we think good about ourselves because that's what he thinks about ourselves. Because that's what daddies do. Daddies make sure that you feel good about yourself. So if prayer is an indicator of a healthy spiritual life, and Jesus had such health seen by his prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Then my attitude And my attitude towards prayer is based on my perspective of who Father God is, then I should view God in prayer differently. And some people get this easier than others because some of you had, you get daddy, you understand him. 
And so when you pray, you pray to him in a different way. See, I had a great father, but life was him was about providing and teaching me to be a provider because that's what he did. He taught me to be a provider. So that I became a father who became a provider. I took care of my family. Life was him was, was about his leading and teaching me to be a leader. I'm a leader because my father taught me to be a leader because that's what father, my father did. My life with my father was about his responsibility and teaching me to bear burdens because that's what fathers do. We bear these burdens and sometimes we do it alone because that's the only way we can carry it is because we can't put that on our wives and we can't put that on our kids. Sometimes we just have to bear the weight and that's what my father taught me. And his discipline in teaching me was to focus on right and wrong and either being right or being wrong. And so I viewed myself in, 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 whether I was right or wrong. It wasn't whether I was good or bad. It was right and wrong. And I felt wrong most of the time. But as a papa, as a daddy, I watched my father play and laugh and encourage and teach and love. And my nephews and nieces would have given their lives for him. If my father would have asked them to do anything, they would have done anything for him. The children would have been like, "Mm, I don't know, Dad, let's weigh this out. It's true. It's not that we wouldn't have taken care of them. We would have had to think about it. The grandkids never would. They never would have thought about it. See, so because of that, when I pray to the provider, I pray to the provider, not the player. You see what I'm saying? When I pray, if I have the wrong perspective on who God is, I pray to the provider, not the player. I, I, don't, I don't play to the one that's with me through the challenge. I pray to the one that I just want him to provide for me so I don't have to. And I pray to the leader, not the laugher. He's always trying to direct me and, and, and correct me. He's not, just, he's not just laughing with me. He's not just joyous over me. He's not just happy with me. This is all work. When I pray to the authority, I pr- I pr- or pray to the father, I pray to the authority, not the encourager. And I pray to the punisher, not the teacher. So when I pray this prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I tentatively approach the Father saying, Father, and there's a little fear with that. If it's possible, knowing that it is possible for you, Father, but it's probably improbable for me because this is how I view myself in light of you. Let this cup pass from me because I'm afraid I can't handle this. So I don't want to go through this, Father. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I don't even know why I'm asking. It's my prayers. I don't even know why I'm asking because it's going to be your way anyway. But if I have an Abba Father, if he is my daddy, I say, Papa, if it's possible to be free from this challenge, Can I be? Because I don't think I can handle it. But I know you love me and have taught me that I have abilities and strengths more than I can see. So if what you're asking me to do is something you think I need to do, I'll do it. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Is God your Abba Father? Because if you view God as your earthly father and he wasn't a good earthly father, you're going to struggle to view God as a daddy. Even if you had a good earthly father that was traditional in the way that he was a father, but he was never a daddy, you're going to struggle in the way that you pray. Because you're going to pray from this belief that I'm talking to a God that is not a daddy. He's not as loving as I think he should be. If your spiritual life is going to be healthy, healthy, you're going to have to abandon the negative words and thoughts that your past life has imposed upon you and be renewed in your thinking. You're thinking about your Father in heaven and how he views you because I believe Jesus and Paul both understood that he was Abba, Father. He was Daddy. He was Papa. 
And when they prayed, they prayed and said, I, this is tough, this is hard, but I know that you love me and I know you believe in me and I know you think the best of me. And because of that, not my will, but yours. I'll do whatever you ask. We must believe and confess that we are the apple of his eye, that we are his treasured possession, that we, that you personally, are the most important person to him right now at this moment. If my granddaughter walked in the room, I would promise you this, I would drop everything, even in the midst of preaching, to go grab her and hold her and tell her she's the most beautiful person on the planet and I'm glad that she's here and I love her. And God's trying to do that with you right now. He's dropping everything. He says, how can God do that? He's God, man. He can do it all. I think he'd drop everything to play with you, enjoy life with you, believe the best in you, and do the best for you. And if you come to God in prayer from an angle that says, God, not just God loves me, but God believes in me. And God cares for me. And God wants to laugh with me and play with me and do life with me. It's easier to do the hard things like crucify yourself for the kingdom. We have to abandon all unhealthy thoughts that come to us through good or bad earthly fathers and see ourselves the way that Papa does if we are going to have a healthy spiritual prayer life. Could we stand, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed, if we could just pray for a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I appreciate the Father that you gave me, and I appreciate the love he showed me the best way he could as a father. But I love the way he loved his grandchildren, and I see in you that papa, that grandpa. Father, there are people in this room that they didn't have that vision, that experience with even you. To, 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 to them, you are that provider, Father. You're that responsible partner, that little bit distant responsible Father. You're that little distant Father. You're that disciplinarian, Father. And I, I'm not saying those aren't attributes that you have that are important attributes, but that is not how you view us, and that's not how you do life with us. So, Father, if there is somebody in the room, Lord God, that just needs a papa this morning, they just need to know that they are the most important person on the planet, that you're singing over them, that you love them, Lord God, that the, the song I sing for Bria, Father, is who's the prettiest girl I know, Bria Leanne. And I think there's people in this room, Lord God, to know that you think that about them, that there's no one greater than, than them in this room right now. And whatever they're going through, Father, whatever their difficulty they're facing, whatever trial they're in, you're right there and you just want them to look to you and say, I'm not disciplining you, I'm teaching you, I'm loving you, I'm laughing with you, I'm living with you, and I love you. Because they are that important to you. So important that you sacrificed your son Jesus on the cross. That their sins could be forgiven. That's how much you love them and value them and want them. And when you look at them, Lord God, you don't see what they've done. You see what your son did for them. So when you look at us, you see us as that little four-year-old that is just looking for some love and has this beautiful little ego that needs to be built up sometimes. And there's people in this room, Lord God, that need to hear today from you that you love them and you value them and you want them and you care for them. And that even if you have to discipline them, it's because you love them. But it will always be after you make sure you understand why we're doing what we're doing. Father, meet us in this place today.
peace, we pray. Amen. If you would please, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just want to pray to that Father, you want to come up, you got daddy issues. Come on, come talk to God about them. Come on. Come talk to God about them. Come on, maybe you've had a wrong view of Father God. Maybe today's the day to get the right view. Maybe you need to change your prayer life today because God so loves you. He doesn't want to break you down. He wants to build you up. He doesn't want to beat your ego out of you. He wants to build it right. He's not telling you lies about you. He's telling you truth. But you're so confused about what's true about you anymore because Satan has twisted the truth about you. Come on, Father God wants to meet with you today. Come on, Father God wants to meet with you today. God, he loves you so much. I think he's laughing at why you're so afraid to call upon him. Come on. He's singing, making up songs with you and about you. And he's singing them over you right now, trying to get your attention. Because he wants you to call upon him with faith and hope. He wants you to be spiritually healthy, and that starts with a right relationship with Father God, Abba, Father, who took you in when you were not your best and adopted you into his family through Jesus Christ. And he never treated you like an adopted child. He always treated you like you were his very own. The way he loves Jesus is the way he loves you. Come on, church, let's be healthy today. Here's what I want you to do this week as people are praying. We try to do something outside. We want to do something inside. Because if you're not strong inside, it's going to be hard to reach the outside. Here's what I want you to do all week, next seven days. I want you to write down two things about God every day. Two things that are true about God. But look at it from a, a, a different vantage point. Look at it if he's your papa. Maybe you had a gra bad papa. Look at him the way that I view my granddaughter. I love her with all my heart. I'd give my life up. If she asked me to quit the ministry, I would run. You used to think, why? I so love her. I would give my life for her. I would do anything. Why? Because I love her. Does God love you that much? And think about how he wants to play with you. How is he playing with you right now? Maybe you're going through a trial and he just wants to be there with you. He just wants to swim with you. He wants to go through the fire with you. Come on, think about how God's an, an encourager to you. What has God said to you about you that you just think is so amazing that he would say that about you? That you're beautiful, that you're strong. Even in your weakness, he can make you strong. And then here's what I want you to do with that information you gain about God. I want you to tell two people in your world something you learned about God as an Abba Father this week. Go to, go to work and share with your coworkers. Abba Father laughs with me. They'll think you're crazy. That's because they don't have an Abba Father. 
Tell him that your Abba Father sings over you. And think about what kind of a song he would sing. If we don't deal with our daddy issues, we'll never have a healthy prayer life. Let's deal with them today. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as people are still praying, I just want to thank you for your love. And I want to be able to pray like Jesus prayed. I want to be able to pray it out. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Father, Abba, I know you love me. And I know you care about me. And I know you can do anything. But I'm struggling right now. And I don't know if I can survive it. But it doesn't matter because I know if I go through it, I'll go through it with you. And I'm not going to worry about my will. I'm just going to be with you and your will. Help us, Father, to be able to pray that prayer honestly and truthfully. In Jesus we pray and all God's people said. Guys, have a great Sunday afternoon. God bless. Don't forget your kids, please, and their pajamas.